Once dubbed by Interpol as the world's most wanted woman, Lisa Marie Smith faced a possible death sentence when she was arrested and charged with drug smuggling in Thailand in 1996. When you go to a Thai prison, you face torture, death, disease and emotional devastation. Welcome to Hell. This is the podcast that tells of the pain Thai prisoners go through and how some of them have escaped. I'm Lisa Tate. I'm a journalist and a chronic podcast creator. This is my third true crime series. Welcome to Escaping Bangkok. And I am delighted today to have David McMillan on the other line from the UK. He is the only Westerner to have ever escaped from Klom Prem Prison. And the story is remarkable. So thank you for being kind enough to share it with us today, David. Oh, I'm a bit of a windbag anyway, Lisa, so it's no trouble at all. <laughs> now, despite his accent, you're part Australian. Do you still regard yourself as an Australian or are you British? Well, my accent's actually a very old-fashioned Australian accent. When I was 12 years old, I did a, a kids' news program in Australia for the Nine Network. Yes. And it was quite a challenge in those days. They didn't have auto cues. You had to actually read the bad carbon copy of the script and had three little lights to say faster, slower, stop... So I I guess they had trouble finding kids who were good readers. I had some good editors back then, but that was before I reached the age of 14 and thought a life of crime would be more interesting. (laughs) Now, this is what I wanted to ask. Were you an escape artist as a kid, like when you were little? Not really. What it was, my parents divorced when I was very young, about three. And though there were quite a lot of, I suppose... father like stepfathers in my life I didn't hold Mm -hmm. them in particularly high regard and I've had a few headmasters say to me that uh, I had no real regard for authority well it's not entirely true it's just I had no regard for them I suppose and also Mm. by, uh, by coincidence I was born with a low resting heart rate and you know what that means that perception of risk is skewed a little bit so you don't really sense it but I'm exaggerating when I I say I I wanted to be in a life of crime. I was a cameraman for a while. I worked at a cinema chain in Melbourne. Yes, I read that. That's amazing. So that's how you started your working career. Yes, and I worked for an ad agency for a while as an in-house TV producer there as well. Macius, it was a big agency, and they they had a thing called Belief Dynamics in which they... (laughs) Uh, assessed what uh, what people believe and then tailored the advertising to them. And I mention it only because I suppose in in dealing with others, even in a, a criminal world, it wasn't they weren't so much fearful as they seemed to be a, a lot of the people involved in it seemed to be in fear, and and that was noticeable. So. Mm-hmm. And the other thing, too, is I met, by chance, a bunch of old safecrackers who'd retired and put some of their ill-gotten gain into putting together dope deals of various kinds, a kind of retirement package for somebody who who liked a a bit of excitement in their life. But what they couldn't do was, or wouldn't do, was travel. And I, I thought that shouldn't be too difficult. Of course, I made a massive amount of mistakes in the in the early days. I'm a bit surprised that I even got anywhere. But we, just to try and put things in a little perspective, if we can imagine the mid-70s in Australia and I guess mm. around the world, the attitude to drugs was not really anything like it is now. There's kind of a, a, a Puritanism that's crept a hold. I mean, we could debate why that was, but it doesn't really matter. And I, I, I found myself in New Delhi uh, trying to get some hashish from the shoeshine boys and being robbed by the scammers at American Express. So it was a fairly fast learning curve there, I guess. OK, and then you ended up in Pentridge, didn't you, in Melbourne, the prison? Yes, there was a... I... After I was running importations for a while from Melbourne, I picked up on some undercover surveillance. I saw my lawyer, and being arrogant, and I, I didn't take his advice. He said, David, 
how big are these people? It, what he meant was how much money were the police spending, and they were spending a lot. They had their own officers. They didn't trust the the local police to keep a secret, and there was about thirty of them. And Task Force Aries, it was called. And wisely enough, my lawyer said, "Look, if they've spent that much money, they're simply not going to let you go. They will make a case, come what may." And and they did. It was a massive trial, a long-ranging, wide, con- general conspiracy to import drugs, and I think there were there were twelve counts. It ran for six months, a hundred and nineteen witnesses, eight thousand wow. pages of transcript from bugs put in the house and and different places. So, it, it was the jury were reasonably even-handed, but I was found guilty of one of the 12 counts, and that was enough, and I ended up with about a 15-year sentence, of which I did 10. Okay, you did 10. That's right. And also, when you started, did you have any idea that it would go this way, or did you just think it was a quick way of making some money for a while? No, not not at all. The money, just to give you an example of how this was a kind of secondary thing, when I, I, I rented a house in, in South Yarra in Melbourne, and I hadn't even furnished it properly. There was a glass top coffee table with probably half a million dollars on it, which was worth a lot more back then than it is now. Oh, my goodness, in the 70s, yes. <laughs> yeah. And look, I always felt some kind of letdown after a successful operation. And the money, well, yeah, that was good. Could do some interesting things with it, buy some toys. But the really attractive part of it was trying to figure out a way through customs, uh, how to cross the borders. And I took a, what I really enjoyed was the kind of R&D of traveling around, finding good contacts, examining the processes of, um, look, I'll just give you one little example. In Australia then, and to some degree now, they had, if they were going to give a passenger a check, there would be two customs officers. Now, they can't check everything. So they open your bag, drop the bag onto your hand, onto their hand, I mean, to feel the weight of the, the lid, and then transfer every object in the, in the suitcase onto the other side. Now, you might ask, well, what's the point of that? The point is the second officer. He's watching. What he looks for is that when teddy bear is picked up and put aside, that is cleared, as it were, he's Mm -hmm. trained to notice the shoulders drop, that you're relaxed, that you're suddenly more talkative or or less. You know, there's a change in demeanor. And he taps his colleague and say, to mean the last thing you touched is it. So once once the systems that they were using were identified, then it was only a matter of figuring out a way to bypass those. Uh, uh, there were many of them. I, I really didn't even want to have couriers, but I married an, uh, an Australian girl, Clelia Vigano, from a, a, a dad had restaurants. A rather a kind of tragic family in a way. Most of them died through illness, even though they were a happy large family, but uh, decimated by cancer. Anyway, my wife had said, asked me to stop running around carrying things myself. So I, I, I went looking people that I thought would be good. And, you know, Lisa, the, the thing to make sure is never to hire a criminal to be your courier. They are terrible at it. Really? Oh, yes. They, they know what jail's about. They know what police are about. And to cross in front of them terrifies them, so they give it away. What you want is... Somebody who's a gambler, somebody who's a fantasist. And in that I found, for example, a really terrific courier. He, he really went into the mood of things, Peter Dale. He had plant shops uh, around town, and he wasn't very successful at that. He was too busy spending his money and daydreaming. But he, I, I watched him at the Vantam Airport, which is the old Brussels airport, going through customs. Mm. And I was surprised to see it. And when he had arrived, he was in a sports outfit carrying a, what looked to be an expensive tennis racket and seemed so relaxed and casual. Of course, he just sailed through. I said, Peter, what were you, what were you thinking of? He said, David, I, 
I was being the international tennis pro, and he utterly absorbed the role of whatever it was, and therefore he was kind of immune. The customs or police just didn't have, they didn't smell that telltale thing. A crook and a policeman eye each other off like stick insects. They are really cut from the same machinery inside. Pursuers, manipulators, and trying to take advantage. It's kind of like a game, but of course the police have the advantage that they don't end up either dead or in jail. At, at the time of the big case, Clelia was in the prison, held because we wouldn't talk, with Mari, my the wife of my business partner, Michael Sullivan. Michael Sullivan had been a, what, he'd been a champion pole vaulter, he was going to be in the Commonwealth Games, did his knee in, ended up as a bartender, then an art school teacher. And um, he made a, a pretty good courier. But anyway, he his wife was scooped up as well because, you know, and we were really trying to make some kind of arrangement, even pleading guilty to get the girls out. Mm. But before that could happen, an informer was placed among them to try and get some information out of it. Unfortunately, Daniel Wright was a an arsonist, as well as being an informer, and set fire to the, the prison. It was the old Fairley women's prison, and the girls were killed. They died in the fire. Really? I didn't know about that. Was What year was that in Melbourne? And that was 1981. Yeah, the, the prison was different from prisons now, of course. Uh, they didn't really even have a radio. They just had a, a loudspeaker into the cells, which got cut off at 11, and... I heard the report of the fire at the women's prison and, of course, conscious that the girls were out there. And Michael and I came out of our cells first thing the next day and went up to the staff and said, OK, what do you know? Well, they kind of looked everywhere and sideways and shuffled a bits of paper and mumbled something about not having accurate reports and all of that. Well, that was it, isn't it? I mean, if... <laughs> If somebody tells you that, what do you think? It means that they're not yeah. wanting to tell you. How many of the girls were there in the other prison? Well, they were... Uh, Clelia and Mary were sharing a dormitory of about, I think, 10, 12, and it was made of wood and covered, I think, then encased in bars, so it, it was really a fire trap anyway, so... And... Yeah, so did everyone in that dormitory die? No, no, only Clelia, Michael's wife, and the informer, the three of them. Oh. And, of course, that led to a lot of conspiracy theories and suspicions, and it didn't really help that the prosecution took advantage of that to terrify the couriers who'd otherwise remained silent into by telling them that, well, you can see the guys have had their wives killed, so uh, are you going to talk now? <laughs> Of course they did. Okay, so you got 10 years in that uh, in the prison there eventually, didn't you? Uh, yes, and it was a tough time. It was through the supermax at uh, Jaika Jaika. <clears throat> that was a place where, what was it, held 48 and had about 20 deaths a year, but eventually ended up at an open prison and then released. But I found myself, of course, pursued from the moment I set foot outside again. This is not much of an excuse for going back to things, but... I actually left the country simply to get away from that level of observation. I, the surveillance, yeah. So that's when you next went to Bangkok. And that's quite a remarkable story because you were behaving yourself at the time. Yes, I was on my way through. I stopped there to pick up some money and I was heading to London. And I had you know, absolutely clean passports. I'd gone to a lot of trouble to get documents that the even though I was under surveillance that, that they wouldn't know about. So I was kind of shocked to find myself arrested there. In Chinatown, wasn't it? Well, I was. They, I could see at the airport that I wasn't going to make it through. Uh, I, I spotted a mm -hmm. couple of surveillance police, so I melted back into the crowd there, went into town, and broke one of the fundamental rules that if, if the heat's on, the f one thing you must never do is go any place or contact anyone whom you've uh, been in touch with in the, while you've been there, during your time there. But I'd, I was so thrown by it, I went to a travel agency where in Chinatown, as you say. <clears throat> but as soon as I arrived, I could see 
<laughs> there was no way out again. I'd walked into another trap, and then I found myself in prison. They did a bit of a sweep of the airport, found, I don't know, what was it, about an ounce of heroin, which was enough for a death sentence. Mm. Did you have that heroin with you at the airport? <laughs> you know, a policeman came out to me and said, David, what was that about? I mean, if it was a couple of kilos, I can imagine it. But uh, I said, no, uh, I had uh, two false passports and uh, $50,000. But they... Uh, look, every day at Bangkok Airport, no, what would you call them? Casual users, small-time smugglers, whatever. They dump their loads... The heroin then, was that planted on you? Effectively. It was courtesy of the airport police. It wasn't on me. When I arrived back at at the narcotics division jail in Chinatown, they, they they held me for having two passports. But a couple of days later, they said, oh, by the way, we found heroin. It must be yours. Oh, okay. Where did you find it? Who dobbed you in? Was it the Australian police? No, the Australian police didn't believe I was in Thailand. I'd, I'd left Michael with, because I knew the phone was tapped, my phone, yep. early days of mobiles. I'd left my phone with Michael and a tape recording of us having a conversation. He was told to, or asked to, go to a pay phone, ring my phone, and play the recording into it. Now, that meant to those listening to it that they had proof that I was in Australia because they just recorded me at a payphone call speaking to Michael. Yeah, so it it came about because the one of the contacts from the old case was a guy called Tommy he was Thai national, he was the nephew of a very big opium trafficker up in the north around Chiang Mai and what I didn't know at the time was that he had a battle with the the uncle, I mean, with the American DEA, and it was the US DEA that had caught me up, had identified that I was in Thailand at the time, and that oh. they could have a little play with me. So it was, you know, I think we could say this, couldn't we? Everybody sitting around a, a prison cell for the first few days can rightfully claim that most extraordinary circumstances had brought them there, very unlikely set of events. And in a way, that's true. And unless somebody's a complete idiot, it's going to be something unusual, isn't it, that, that brings you in, in, in many cases anyway. But that was extremely unusual. But unfortunately, you can't win a case in Thailand. 99% conviction no. rate and the evidence is, well, whatever they feel like it. Now, you pleaded not guilty... Yes. And what did they call the defence? There was a funny term that they used to describe the defence lawyers. Oh, well, I think you might be thinking of what the courts, their slang term in Thai for the yeah. defence case. Yeah. The Oh, wait a minute. Yes, the accused persons are called sinners and yeah. the defence case is termed as the dream. And it might as well That's be quite it. a dream, really. You pleaded not guilty, am I right with that? Yes. Yeah. I've never been convicted yep. of anything there. So do you think then they might have, it might have gone a little bit easier if you pleaded guilty or it's just margins? Well, if, you're, if a person is sentenced to death and he pleads guilt, which you can really do at the very last moment, that's usually reduced to life. Now, life in Thailand is 99 years. And there used to be a lot of reductions in the sentence through royal amnesties and and national events. But drug traffickers have been excluded from that. Murderers and drug traffickers don't... Oh, wait a minute, I'm wrong. Murderers do get the the benefit of it, but drug traffickers don't. Yeah, we've had a couple, yeah, here in Australia. So you went to Klong Prem... Mm. What were you expecting? Because you were in the filthy holding cells for six days... What were you expecting when you walked through? I knew a little about it. I'd known of a couple of people who'd been through, so I knew it was going to be bad. Even so, I kind of half thought there would be some wonderful, like like in a Colombian prison, some wonderful oasis of corrupt high flyers or something like that where there'd be good conditions, but it simply didn't apply there. Nobody is in a Thai prison that is not, as they see it, unlucky. And when I say unlucky, this 
the idea of luck in Thailand is 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 very much run into the Buddhist viewpoint and an outlook. For example, most Thais in the prison believed that the Western world was rich because they were lucky, no other reason, and mm -hmm. uh, uh, very rigid to form. So. There wasn't any. Uh, all I found was really amongst the Westerners were the dregs of that kind of half world of Swiss, French, Scandinavians who'd burnt out all their luck everywhere else and and ended up just you know, turning on anybody that tried to help them. So they ended up in that kind of place. They they were friendless. They had nothing. They could barely feed themselves. The, the, it's fish head soup for what they call government mm. food, and the insult to the injury is they make the prisoners pray for about 15 minutes over the brown rice, which is crawling with weevils. Mind you, the weevils are quite nutritious, so I shouldn't complain, really. No. Well, you never know. A bit of protein. But, David, the one thing, I've been reading your book, Escape, the true story of the only Westerner ever to break out of Thailand's Bangkok Hilton, and... The one thing that strikes me is, according to the book, when you got in there, you were already planning. The cogs had started turning about your escape. I, I wrote Escape really because I, I had to kind of keep a distance from it. I probably explain it better in the new one, Unforgiving Destiny. But what it was, I, I wanted to kill myself, and that was very difficult to do. Because you had no privacy. No, no, you, you couldn't get a... a Dormitories made for 64 people lying next to each other already had 130, 140 inmates in there. So you didn't have a single moment. I think there was one guy in the, in the building I was in who had a kind of a carpentry workshop. He, he used to rent it out for people who wanted privacy. Of course, they weren't entirely alone, the people who, who rented his little shack, usually for some tryst amongst themselves. But it, it shows you that even amongst the gay scene in the prison, they... they uh, oh, well, that's true. In the dormitories, they used to get the towels and tie them to the railings of the, the windows and pin the other yes. end to the floor. And they'd make a kind of little pup tent and you'd hear lots of giggles going on from in there. So I suppose <laughs> that was a sort of privacy. So... You mentioning that carpentry store, that's where you spent a lot of time, didn't you, in terms of like planning for the things that you needed to get out of this hellhole? Not in that place. I was in what they call Bambat. It means the cure, the drug remand section. I quickly got out of there because it's, it's just impossible to get your own cell or, or, or any kind of control over anything. They didn't even uh, allow cash money, which they do in the main prison. So I made sure I got transferred with some other peons to the, the main part of Klong Prem for sentenced prisoners, and that's much better. I, uh, with a Scotsman, and I'm trying to think of those. There was a couple of Australians there, but one of them was Lao Chinese, so, but still Australian, and it spoke with an Australian accent. And, but I managed for a reasonable, I suppose it was, what, 500 Australian dollars a month, lived quite well, and, and, and renovated a, a cell and had the pick of who would live in there. So... And you had a light switch, which is amazing because they leave the lights on, you've got to sleep under that fluorescent light. Oh, it's terrible, really. I said to the... I put it in there and I said to the building chief, look, uh, chief, uh, I don't know about you, I can't sleep a damn unless it's dark. You understand. And he... He got himself a new air conditioner so he could sleep more comfortably in his office. So it was a balance of uh, interests, you could say. Oh, my goodness. So I always thought, yeah, money, but I didn't know air conditioners were part of the bartering system. <laughs> you know, they had a, a general store there, strangely named the coffee shop, and it sold everything, rice, food, dry goods, cans. It, it even had a little bank around the corner where prisoners could withdraw from their held money account within the prison in cash for 25%. And they'd use that cash just for their day-to-day -day needs or gambling or whatever they like to do. And it was so organized. I was offered that once, the ownership or renting, you could say, of the franchise of the coffee shop, $5,000 it would have been. 
and, I, and supposedly I only had to pay 25% of the profits to the building chief, but I knew too well what happened to people who took such a high fly. It'd be a bit, you know, when, especially in Australia, uh, when a businessman becomes too big for his boots, as people see it there, the, the downfall is quick and sudden. And so it was better to, I was in my little office that I, I rented out, which was under a hut, really, it was in a the art shop that did shell paintings, which went for sale outside at the edge of the prison. And it was very quiet. And I had uh, Noel Reggie, who was our chef, and what I had my chief butler, <laughs> Jet, Nong Sam Hasip Jet. He was the seventh of large family. And I think we had a carpenter. He, he wasn't any good as a carpenter. But then again... It was really just an excuse to join more at our table so that, you know, we uh, we, we could have people we quite liked. And, and, and some very odd characters. I mean, there was <clears throat> some... I think he was Iranian, but here's the thing. He had no idea what his name was. Not his real name. He knew names. He didn't know who his father was. He didn't know what country he came from. And he had no idea why he was in prison. <laughs> He'd been there five years. So wow. we, we didn't know what to do with him, but we made him our chimney sweep. So Because all the other jobs were taken, the ice carriers and the bed makers and all of that kind of thing. Because it might sound quite comfortable. You know, that there, I was in, my cell had, what, five in it, and there was hardly any Australians in there at the time. Well, they, they ended up in Bang Kwan, which is a place I didn't want to go to. They seemed to... The Australians more or less came in on fairly biggish cases. So they passed... The only one... The, uh, the building chief called me in one day and said, I've got a, an Australian for you. Oh, yeah. But he was uh, some kind of creepy child molester, and I, I really... I think it would have been unlucky for him to be in my cell. There's yes, a ghost. There was a ghost in there that you know. I I, caught, I used to. I took over the mail job, the the censor of a foreigner's mail. Even though my own mail went out by my own guard, who's I used to give him my ATM cards, and he'd he'd go to the ATM for ten percent. It was cheaper than using the coffee shop. Anyway, um, I noticed it, this this pervert used to send. Uh, you know those reply cards you get in magazine where they send you a catalogue? And this was for mm. children's fashions. <laughs> so I went to him with his... Uh, I said, really, that doesn't actually count as a piece of mail. In fact, look, it's not my business what, what you did. People who wish me dead might think that I'm worse than you. But I really don't want to know about your life and don't have it come to me again. But they... It was very hard to find people. You're right in the sense that the moment I went into the, the bigger prison, escape was what I had in mind. Uh, I stayed in Building 6 because the bars were the smallest of all of the buildings there. They were round as opposed to the, uh, the so-called foreigners' building too, which had big, heavy slab bars that would have taken forever to cut through. It was Michael who sent me the tungsten tip hacksaw blades from Australia to... Yes, that was crucial. Did you had five or six of those, didn't you? No, just four, but four was enough. They used four to allow enough. a bit more leeway with the foreigners' parcels because they came from Western countries. With the ties, they used to cut their soap bars in half and pour out their shampoo into newspapers and so on, unless they were well-to-do ties, of course. But the So I did say to Michael, make this a massive packet so that the hacksaw bars won't be discovered. And... Um, and he did. He, he filled it up with Fortnum and Mason's, you know, lax tongues in aspic, or, you know, ag exotic candies and uh, pâtés and, and things like that. Pâtés as well. Yeah, yeah. Lots of good stuff. And some clothes and a couple of cartons of cigarettes. And I always gave one of the cartons of cigarettes to the guard. But, Lisa, I had to think of something that would so distract the guard that he, his mind would not be capable of looking further at the contents of my parcel. Now, the hacksaw blades, that was quite ingenious how you managed to get them. But what else did you need? Mm. Well, that's the thing I, I didn't know. Um, 
I had, uh, of course, some gaffer tape and cable ties and mm. that sort of thing. And I had a little Swiss Army knife that I kept with me. And, and you had the bamboo ladder. Well, that, that took a bit of constructing because I got a tour of the prison and, and found that the outer wall, after many inner walls, was very high. It was like 15 metres or something like that, 16. And that might so- sound like mm. not a lot, but that is beyond the reach of any conventional ladder. Um, you know, in the building trade, you'd, you'd need a, a triple-run ladder to get up at that. Plus, it had electricity running through wires around the top. And yes. that was something to think about. So <laughs> Yes, it definitely was. And that's what I wanted to ask you, because I've been thinking about this. When you went through the electrified wire, was that really painful or were you just in the zone and it didn't matter? The ladder was made of picture frames taped between bamboo poles from the one of the factories. My friend, a Swedish guy, pretended to take an interest in oil painting, so he was making up lots of picture frames. So you can imagine the rectangular frame made made good struts on the thing. But even that ladder, by the time I eventually got it, I mean, I, I managed to cut out of the bar just, only just uh, after about two o'clock in the morning. And it's a different world at night. Those considering running around in the middle of the night getting up to no good should take into account that which I did not. And the world is different at night. It is quiet. And you used to watch the guards, didn't you? You watched them for months. Well, yes, and it wasn't very helpful. Mostly they just went to... They had beds made up by by the trustees and they'd usually go to sleep. But the trouble is... They were in key spots, so they could get up to take a pee or something like that. But most of the... uh, And everybody really... I was going to go out with a few other people. Bear in mind that I'd been told by my lawyer that my case would end in two weeks' time and that I would be executed. If not, actually, it was by machine gun in those days, so I guess it was pretty quick. You were in a dire situation... Well, it's not good. Oddly enough, it wasn't going to be the last time I was on death row, but that's another story. I met some people once who were in a drug case and were sentenced to death in Saudi Arabia. And and here it was that now no, nobody manages, almost nobody, to get out of a death sentence in, in Saudi Arabia. And yet they did. <clears throat> I asked her. One of them said, I thank God and George Bush. And that was because the Gulf War I broke out at the time and all foreigners were released from the Saudi prisons. But I only mention that because you'd think, wouldn't you, that having, by a small miracle, escaped a certain death, they would have kept out of the drug business, but they didn't. I, I guess that says something about deterrence, doesn't it? It's not so easily yes, done. Yes, it does. <laughs> And I must say, your low heart rate must have come in handy that night when you were escaping. It was, but somehow, I mean, it was very exhausting too, because I I didn't know where I was. It was before Google Maps. My friends couldn't tell me what the real layout of the prison was. You know, I only looked at a a proper close-up picture of it from the air a couple of months ago. It's huge. It holds actually tens or more sub-prisons, and the total number in there, including the women's prison, is 22,000. It's like a city, really. Do you know who you were in with at the same time? It's one of the people we focus on in this podcast is Lisa Marie Smith from Melbourne, Australia. She was in the women's prison there for five months until she escaped on bail. Um, yes, and I so know. You, they had two Australians in the same week. So you escaped the same week as Lisa. So I think our name would have been Mud at the time amongst the ties. Oh, no. yeah. Strangely enough, I was told by uh, somebody who was still in there and used to go to the occasional. The foreign embassies used to put on a bit of a lunch for either their national holiday or Christmas or something like mm. that. Never the British, mind you, but certainly the Australians did. And I think the best food was from the French embassy, which is to be expected, I guess. 
but the best services from Scandinavia. I, I mention all of this only that if somebody finds himself with a choice of nationalities in, in dire like circumstances, French. they should really go for Scandinavian for the best services or New Zealand if you're on the other side of the world. You, you might say Australia, but Australia doesn't really help terribly much the, their inmates in, in drug cases. In fact, it's my understanding, and, and pretty much I was told by the consular services, that there's a case you probably don't remember of Barlow and Chambers. They were executed. Yes, in, I uh, do. Yeah. Were they in Malaysia? Uh, yes, they were. And yeah. the same with the Bali Nine. Uh, permission were was asked of the Australian government whether this was acceptable. And the Australian government said, we could never officially say so, but go ahead. We won't, we won't get... We, we'll make a, a standard statement saying we, we don't approve of the death penalty, but hang them high or shoot them in the case of the Bali Night, which I think is a little bit chicken, don't you? I mean, if you're going to have an attitude about something, like execute all drug traffickers, fine. But I think the government should have had the, the backbone to stand up and say that's what they were doing. I mean, anybody who believes that an Asian country or any country will execute a foreign national without the permission of countries with whom they've got consular relations is in dreamland. It, it simply doesn't happen, except where there, there's a clash wow. between those countries, maybe like um, Iran versus the UK or, or something like that. But it's it's always checked first. I, I remember there was an, a French girl sentenced to death in Malaysia, and the French simply said, oh, what you sit to the Malaysians? You're serious about this, really? Yeah, well, I mean, we planned to execute her, and we hadn't done a woman for a while, especially a foreigner. <laughs> OK. And the French said, well, you can't. Oh. Oh, if that's the way... They, they just... <laughs> They even went overboard. They just released her. It's, it's, it's really nutty. So, Oh, wow. She's a lucky person then. She was. She was maybe, I don't know, maybe she had some friends, friends high up with the, the French. I don't know. So take us through that night. Mm. Well, as I say, it was about 2 o'clock in the morning when I got out. No, I'd only cut one bar. I couldn't get anybody to come with me, which turned out to be a piece of luck, really. It did. I should just should say, why wasn't anybody with me? We had a couple of Israeli guys that had turned up there. They, they were in these heavy elephant chains. They'd managed to get out of the uh, local lockup in Chiang Mai, but they were caught, of course. And their, their legs had been smashed with iron bars and rocks placed upon them so that when they finally were brought to Bangkok for the high security prison, their legs looked like, I don't know, twisted drinking straws or something like that that had been squashed up by some kid. So it was very off-putting for my fellow prisoners to... They didn't have perhaps the incentive that I did. But at 2 o'clock in the morning, I found that everything took a lot longer. I had to go to my little office and get out my picture frames. And e even getting to the ground, I burnt my hands on the, the rope that I was using. Yes. And then... But I kept it. I, I'd need as much of that as I could. By the way, the rope was not actually rope. It was kind of nylon-woven webbing from the army boot factory. But it's not unusual to, in, in Asian prisons to find there's lots of tools around, lots of things, because people generally don't escape because the consequences of getting caught are so high, and secondly, they've usually confided in somebody. But I hadn't confided in anybody that night, and... And also, David, I just wanted to say, if you're caught escaping, would you be tortured? What? Yeah, I mean, the, 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 I saw an attempt when I was in the other section, and the, it was some four kind of street gang guys from Bangkok and a Singaporean. Singaporean was not treated quite so badly, but they beat the others to death slowly over three months. They put them in a kind of half-sized coat locker that was their punishment cell on a, on a bowl of rice a day and a, a paint tin for a toilet a small one um, okay then you're it's 2 a.m in the morning you're checking out what's going on and it's just you yes so as i say i, I can just managed to squeeze out of the the cell window got to the ground i, I had to use a, a bookshelf well it wasn't really a bookshelf it was the plank that was going out of the window to get 
far enough away from the prison building wall because underneath me there was broken awning. I couldn't touch that. It would set off the alarm with the other prisoners. Any Thai prisoner who would have seen me that night would have screened the place down. They certainly would have informed on me. I managed to get my bamboo poles together. I had a little flashlight, held it in my teeth as I used the gaffer tape to make my two ladders. Found myself in at the back of one of the factories. I couldn't go out the way I came because uh, too much of a possibility of a guard going there, so I had to kind of break out of that factory through the bank, down into the prison auto repair shop, under another gate, past the water tanks and the rows of open-air toilets, then hook myself over the first of the internal walls. I didn't realise then that there would be seven of them. Seven, wow. And had to... Well, you kind of find a technique, and the technique was to push my very long ladder, it's really two, taped together, to the middle of the wall, climb up it, use my weight climbing down the other side to Mm. swing the back end of it up and, and drag it over. That... I wasn't really sure where I was. I took a couple of blind turns, but luckily between two and, say, five, you can just about guarantee that the guards are all asleep. Or if they're walking around, you know they'll just be... They're not actually on patrol. They're just going to get a drink or whatever. They're they're doing something, going back to bed. But luck was with me to a degree, and I, I got to, I got stuck under a barbed wire fence and had to climb underneath. I got my bearings somewhat because there was the AIDS death ward there, and I knew that was near the outside wall, and I could tell I was near there through the the smell coming through the windows. They have a kind of necrotic, rotting flesh smell. Well, that's uh, that's come up a lot in this podcast. Is the rotting flesh situation that people are just left there. Yeah. Well, there was no there was no, no cure today, but there was certainly no real treatment. No. So you knew from sort of the smell where you were. That's right. I even looked inside and, and they were just too far gone to raise the alarm or even possibly know what was going on. Their, their grey, kind of sticky-looking faces and then made my way... I had an obstacle before I got to the outside wall. There was an internal moat, which was really the sewer that we called Mars Bar mm. Creek, for obvious reasons. And <laughs> yes. here's the problem, Lisa. You imagine you've got your ladder, you've got your the wall that you want to be. Mind you, I don't know what's over that wall. I was not sure what's on the other side, what part of okay. the prison it was. But I can't... It's, I, I can't put it into Mars Bar Creek because it's full of barbed wire and it'll get tangled up. And then I can't get it to the other side of Mars Bar Creek because there's only one foot of land, as it were, there. So I had to figure a way of getting this very long ladder angled over to the side, and that looks too long to go into now. But I only mention it because it was the kind of puzzle that had I been with somebody else, if, if any of... I mean, the only person who actually wanted to go with me was my manservant, Jet. <laughs> Just as I was about to go through the window in the cell, I turned around to find he'd dressed himself up in his best clothes, I don't know why, like he was going on a visit or something, and his only possessions were a whole lot of letters and photographs that he had wrapped up in a plastic bag. Isn't that cute? It was kind of touching in a way, but I, I gave him my watch and some money and asked the Scandinavian Swedish guy to look after him because they were in for a bit of a hard time the next day, that's for sure. Oh, absolutely, when you weren't there. So you're out by Mars Bar Creek. No, Mars Bar River. <laughs> Well, no, well, and I called it the creek. I managed to get the, the ladder over. I suppose if somebody wants the details of that, they'd have to read Unforgiving Destiny, but that's it for the plug. The <laughs> Yes, Unforgiving Destiny is your latest book, isn't it? It's on audio as well. Anyway, though people are probably sick of the sound of my voice halfway through this podcast, but I hope no. not. So uh, I've got the thing up against the wall. I wash myself off because I'm filthy. I, I use the last of my drinking water to clean myself up, put on some long khaki trousers. The reason being that prisoners are not allowed to wear long pants, but only guards are. 
climbed to the top of the ladder. A friend of mine made me a little device to check the, the voltage of this thing, but I could feel it anyway through my trousers. Uh, the sweat that was just salty enough, I guess, to make a little conductance. So I, the ladder was a little bit short of the top of the wall, but I very carefully held onto the bars between the, the wires and the strands and levered myself over the top and was left with just enough rope to slide down to the other side. But where was I? Wow. I was had another moat in front of me. It was 30 metres across. It was huge. It was like a massive river. I had a plan, sort of, a plastic bag. I'd put my clothes in that, swim across the moat. But I'd lately found out that on the other side were the, the houses by a lot of prison guards, and that was probably not the kind of uh, suburbs I really wanted to go to first off. Besides, the sun was coming up. It had just coming up to six o'clock. So I had no alternative but to yeah. walk to where I knew the front of the prison was. Now, the moat has a couple of little bridges to cross over. And I thought, now the, this tower's every uh, 200 feet or so. And I was pretty sure some of the guards were looking down over the towers to see who it was that was walking on this skinny path. But luckily I had, well not luckily, I guess it was, uh, one, of, one of the factories in there, they made umbrellas and, and I, I picked mm. up a pop-up umbrella to use outside to hide my pale face. You know, it's, it's a mm. funny thing being, you know what they used to call the... Uh, the foreigners in there, the Australians, Brits, and every Americans, they used to call us the white trash, except for you know the few that weren't, and uh, uh, put in chains. Now, and here I was hiding my white face because my pale face would be putting a target on my back. It's quite, it, it's not a bad thing for a smug. Europeans, if I can call all of us kind of that, which we are, yeah. I suppose, if uh, a smug Westerners can have the experience of being an outcast, having been uh, a, a target because of your skin colour, having been thrown in chains and facing death, it yeah. is something that kind of puts everything into perspective. But I wasn't thinking about that. I had my umbrella down and got to the front, and it was not a bad time because people were arriving, the places opening up, the shops that string around the little industries around the edge of the prison were coming to life. And I very carefully picked my way through those, and there was just enough rain coming down to you know, make it plausible that I would have to use an umbrella. I thought that rain was some kind of shower from the gods there to see me on my way. Mm. I, in later years, I'd come to realize it wasn't that at all. It was just the spittle from the gods' laughter as they knew I was heading for worse <laughs> things. That's all. But there's a six-lane highway that goes out of the front of the prison and a pedestrian bridge that yeah. crosses over. I climbed up that, went to the middle of it, and took a minute to turn around and look at the huge prison behind me. And I imagine what I knew to be, well, at the time I thought only about 10,000, but there was more people in there. And the feeling was most odd. It was not panic and run, but why are they staying there, I asked myself. So we get. did you get a taxi from there? I did. I, I had a friend of mine, had, and you know who your friends are when you're you know, facing death and nobody thinks you're going to win, yet they still do things for you, in, which ca in this case was to... <clears throat> take my old Australian radio operate, operator's license, which had a photograph in it, take that picture and transfer, copy it, transfer it into a, a recently found, bought, stolen, I don't know, British passport, and then have all the things done to the passport that's necessary, have that hidden in a special spot in a flat around town, to which I had the key. So I took two taxis so that to, to burn my trail, as it were, got to the flat about 6.45, let myself in, and found myself in the bathroom there, looking, oh, feeling, really, behind the mirror above the toilet, because that's where I was told this passport would be. And you have to ask yourself then, 
Yeah, Lisa, you're in prison. You've been framed for a murder. You managed to break out. One of your friends has said that she's got you a phony passport with all the you know, bells and whistles on it, all the trimmings, and hidden it uh, in a special spot just waiting for you. And you've only got three weeks to use it because it's got a visa in it and everything else. How many people amongst everybody you met in your life, perhaps with the exception of your husband, would actually do such a thing like that? <laughs> well, anyway, I felt behind the mirror and there it was, the passport. Good enough, it looked, and I headed straight for the airport. Time was soon to be against me, I thought, and it was, I probably got there about 9.30, maybe 10. I had two ATM cards, and I planned to travel as far as I could. Put the ATM card in while looking at the big board to see what destinations were available. And the ATM card said, please contact bank. Hmm. Which is not what you Oops. want when you haven't got a lot of time. No. The other one managed to produce $500. Good enough. But that would only take me to Singapore, where they would ship me back to Thailand very quickly and had the death penalty in any event. Mm. Nonetheless, I managed to... I mean, I got through a Thai immigration and the, my Chinese triad friends had whipped up this passport pretty well. It seemed to be on the computer. Stamped out, got on the plane. There was a couple of nervous minutes before I got there. Into the air, flew an hour, landed, took another couple of taxis after... And this passport was pretty good. They stuck it... At, it looked a bit yeah. iffy because of their old photo in it. And a guy stuck it under the ultraviolet lamp. And sure enough, the three little crowns that come up, they're pink on a British passport that show that it's genuine, they appeared. So... Wow. I thank the Chinese gods as well as the other ones. Got to a, a hotel. Now... Uh, your pick of hotels, if you're on the run, is not high-end. Why? If it's a five-star, there's going to be security people from the big knob staying there, so you don't want that, do you? If it's one-star, you get all the scum that are trying to uh, figure out who you are and how you can be robbed, and you don't want that. You pick something like three-star commercial travellers, ordinary, 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 and that's what I had. And I went straight to dump my little travelling bag in my room, then went to the kind of gift shop in the hotel, bought a pair of swimming trunks, went to the top floor where they had a swimming pool and dived straight in for the best swim I've ever had in my life. <laughs> and then... I think that's a good point to kind of leave that on, but do you have any, like, final words or what kind of advice would you give people? Is it a life they should try or maybe not? <laughs> I think it's days, if the days were ever there when it was something worth having, it's, it's not any longer. It was, look, the, the world was quite a different place. Everybody thought drugs would be legal within a few years, even things like heroin. It's, it's a sad life. It's a risky drug. It, Anybody's a, had to be a complete idiot not to know that it's so massively addictive you, you have to struggle to get out mm. of it. Not only that, let's just say it's not heroin, it's something else, it's cocaine or, or something a little less razor sharp. It's still your... You know, there's a lot of people who are, you won't be surprised to know, are not, not very good, not very trustworthy. And ultimately, there's jail at the end of it. There's no, no dodging it forever. And our lives are too short for that, I think. I certainly would have been a happier person, I think, if I'd found some other occupation all those years, but I did not. And then I went on after that to find bigger trouble in Afghanistan and, and Pakistan, which is, mm. is another story again, isn't it? <laughs> There's another story, another book? Yeah, yeah, I guess it is. Yeah. yeah. Well, David McMillan, thank you so much for being on Escaping Bangkok. I will have links to David's YouTube and where you can buy his books as well in the in the show notes. So, yes, thank you, David. We really appreciate you no, sharing your story. No, thank you for having me. It's good to speak to a... I still consider myself an Australian, especially when I get angry. <laughs> and... <laughs> The Australian accent comes out a bit stronger if there's something, somebody to be reckoned with. And now I'm 66 and old and knackered, and it's, even if people have nothing but contemptors, may, they may well do, 
There's probably no reason mm. not to share some of the interesting things that happened, I guess. If you'd like to support this podcast, you can gift us via the link on our website to buy me a coffee. I'd really appreciate that. And also, it entitles you to exclusive content. I have exclusive photos. I have additional details. I have it all. This podcast was recorded on Warramai land. We acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which this program was produced. We pay our respects to all First Nations people and acknowledge Elders past and present. If you enjoy our show, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts and be sure to come back next week. Until then, this is Lisa Tate and don't forget to ask yourself, could you survive a Thai prison? This is the Escaping Bangkok Podcast. If you're hungry for more, follow us, Escaping Bangkok Podcast, on TikTok, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter or visit escapingbangkok.com.